It puts the whiskey skin in the cup, and it does this whenever it's told. It puts the whiskey skin in the cup or else it gets the hose again. This video is sponsored by Touch of Modern, but more on that later. My name is Leandro Demon Riva, and this is the Educated Barfly. The 80s called, and they want their cocktail name back. Let's get into making the drink. This video is sponsored by Touch of Modern. Touch of Modern is a website geared towards men. They got clothing, gadgets, spirits, tools, any of those cool things that you want to have under your Christmas tree, they got it. So what we found is this really nice bottle of Blanton's. This is a special edition Blanton's called the Takara Red Japanese Edition. Let's just take it out of the box, shall we? Oh yeah, look at this. Nice velveteen bag. And there we have our Blanton's Kara Red Japanese Edition Whiskey. Bottled at 46.5% ABV or 93 proof. So I'm really stoked that we found this on Touch of Modern, but I just wanted to let you guys know that the whole website is kind of based on the idea that there's limited stock of things and the inventory is changing all the time. So you may not find exactly what we found on the website, but you will find stuff just like it. So if you're looking for that perfect gift for yourself or someone else, go to touchofmodern.com and find some really cool stuff, just like I did. So today's drink is the bastard child of a couple of old drinks. One of them is called uh, Hot Whiskey, uh, which probably originated in Ireland sometime in the 1700s. And then the other one's called a Whiskey Skin, which is uh, a very pared down hot toddy, which was definitely being served in the 1750s. I mean, hot toddies were being served in the 1750s. The Whiskey Skin enjoyed some popularity in the mid to late 1800s. There's a very interesting story, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Usually these cocktails are made with uh, either Irish whiskey, like a pot still Irish whiskey, or uh, some type of single malt scotch. Today, I'm gonna be doing an American version of that with one of my favorite bourbons that we got at Touch of Modern, and we're gonna be calling it an American Whiskey Skin. So this is a very, very simple cocktail. First thing we're gonna do is preheat our glass by putting some hot water into the cup like so. Wait for that to heat. We're gonna be building this in the glass. Now that that's sufficiently heated, we can go on with the rest of the cocktail. Now, technically a whiskey skin does not have any sugar content in it at all. It is literally just a little bit of whiskey, hot water, and a stripe of lemon peel, but we're gonna be doing something a little bit different. This is a little trick that I learned from Jim Meehan from his book, The Bartender's Manual, which you guys should pick up. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna add a half an ounce of honey syrup into our glass. Next, we're gonna add two ounces of our Blanton's Single Barrel Takara Red to the glass like so. Just gonna give it like a little mix here. Just combine the ingredients. Then we're gonna take a lemon, rather large lemon, really. I'm gonna cut the sides off like this. We just need one little wedge here. And we're gonna take some cloves, just like a few, like five cloves. We'll cut little slits in our lemon. And we are gonna stick our cloves into the lemon. Do Americans stick them in oranges for the advent calendar type thing? Do Americans stick cloves in oranges? Yeah. For advent calendar? Not that I know of. Is that a Norwegian thing? I think it's for advent. Yeah, you stick them like in and you take one out every day until it's Christmas. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, advent calendars are just like, you know, they're just exercises in uh, commerce now. It's just, uh, you know, open a door, take a chocolate out, count down to Christmas. But I've never heard the orange thing. Then, Although, yeah. I mean, I could be wrong. And when it's Christmas, you get to eat the orange. Let me get this straight. <laughs> you stick an orange in, into the advent calendar. No, no, no. The, the orange is the advent calendar. You stick 24 cloves in, you take, take one out every day until Christmas, and then you voila. And then yeah. you just eat the orange as the if clove infused into the orange a bit? Because it's in the peel, right? It's in the peel, yeah. So the, the clove isn't doing anything. Other than the... indicate Christmas, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, if you guys want to squeeze this in, you can squeeze this in, but we're going to take this and put it... Sorry, I completely just ignored your... Just abruptly mm -hmm. just ignored your... your I'm used thing, to it. So. Uh, I'm sorry that I did that. Um, I just don't know where to go with this whole... Because it just doesn't seem like the cloves are doing anything in the orange, right? So it's just like you oh. stick the cloves in. Yeah. So wait, you have an orange which just serves as your advent calendar. Yeah, and then you have 24 cloves in. You have 10, 24 cloves just aside, aside in a cup somewhere. No, they're in, you put them in oh, the you orange. You put them all in the orange. So kinda they start like, in the orange. And then every like, day you pick one out. Yeah. Until And then at the 24th one, it's Christmas. And then you eat the and orange. And then at the end, you eat the orange, which pe the peel sort of smells like clove a little, but... But but that's it. That's it. And so that's your advent calendar in Norway. Did you do this as a child? 
I don't think I ever did it as an advent calendar, but we used to put it in for decoration. But uh, I think that's what it used to be, the advent calendar before. Because I guess oranges were like a oh, like in the rare 1800s thing. Or something? Yeah, no, maybe. no, no, you in the 1800s, you had oranges. And uh, I don't know. When did oranges come to Norway? Maybe in the 40s, oh, I maybe? So? I, I have no idea when oranges 30s. came to Norway. I don't know. But I, I was thinking just my own childhood. I've never heard of this. So then when in America would this have been a thing? Because you were asking if this was a thing here, right? So when would this have been a thing? And I was like, the 1800s? Maybe, but I don't even know if in the 1800s they had oranges. People well, in the 1800s no, here they had oranges. rancid meat. They had oranges here because they grew. Yeah, maybe in the late 1800s, but like not until like they weren't growing oranges in the early 1800s in California, I don't think. Were they? Maybe they were. I don't know. I don't know enough about California history. Where's oranges from? They're, uh, they're like a Middle Eastern fruit? You're asking me all sorts of like, if you want to have these asides, we need to do some research ahead of the video because what it is is just us doing a whole bunch of like, uh, I wonder, I wonder without any facts to back it up. So. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the advent calendar thing is a fact, so. Well, the advent calendar is a, uh, a thing as a fact, but we don't know anything about its history. We don't know when it was instituted. We don't know when oranges came to Norway. We don't know when oranges <laughs> basically came to the United States. We don't know where oranges are from, so it's not very, it's not very informative little aside. I'm pretty sure they're like here. Asian, Middle Eastern Asian. They probably are. I mean, I don't know. I kind of feel like everything is a bastardization off the citron. Like the citron was like the one fruit and then everything else was just sort of, I don't know. It was just sort of like, like kind of engineered well, I'm sure there was a bunch of different uh, citrus fruits that grew. Wild. Yeah, maybe the citron being the well, the citron I, I know gave birth to the lime. For instance, like the lime is just like a, a bastardized citron, basically. Okay, can we finish this cocktail? Because our the glass is rapidly getting cold. We've taken our cloves, we put it into a peel of a lemon, like so. You can express this lemon into the glass if you want to. I like to just kind of sit it in here like this. Now, you just basically do it yourself, hot toddy. What we're gonna do is we're going to take boiling water and we're gonna put it in here. Now, before I do this, I wanna tell you a little bit like why this all kind of works and what makes it special. When you make this drink, you wanna make sure that you do it with boiling water. And the reason why is because when you put boiling water into spirits, the spirits, have a lower boiling point than water. So water is at 200 degrees. The boiling point in Fahrenheit of spirits is 170. So when you put boiling water into the spirits, some of the spirits will actually evaporate into a mist. And so when you drink it, you are gonna get this very sort of heady punch of alcohol right in your nose. What's nice about that is that that vapor is going to kind of work with the aroma of the cloves and give you this nice, clove smell as you drink. So it is just a little hack. It's not going to lower the alcohol content that much because this is going to rapidly cool. So we're just going to pour our water in here like so, just about four ounces, and then you have your American whiskey skin. Yes, and as I can get, you get that punchy alcohol right up front and you get that clove right up front and you get the oil from the lemon really nice because you have all of the flavor of the bourbon and it's doctored up with just a little bit of the savory sweetness of honey. So it's this nice holiday flavored hot whiskey. And then if you want to make it a little bit more like a hot toddy and you don't mind putting your fingers in your own drink, you just fish this guy out, squeeze a little bit of lemon inside there like so, and then you have a clove lemony hot toddy thing. Fantastic. I love it. So good. So while I was doing some research on this cocktail, I found out a very interesting story printed in David Wondrich's Imbibe about this cocktail, and it goes like this. There was a bartender that was bartending at this place on Howard Street in New York City late at night, uh, 1855. His name was Richard Stark. He was a 17-year-old bartender. And in walks three guys into his bar, and one of these guys was this well-known, street-tough, uh, safe cracker named Richard McLaughlin. So Richard McLaughlin and his couple of boys ask for a whiskey huh? from the bartender. No. The bartender gives him the drink, and then he takes wait the drink second. and he dashes the scalding water into his face. Hey, wait, 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 wait. wait. So what? when I was editing this video, I was looking for a picture of uh, Richard McLaughlin, mm -hmm. but I couldn't find anything. So I Googled more, and then it turns out his name is Patrick McLaughlin. Wait, are you trying to say but that David a, Wondrich got a run? It, yes, but there's a whole other world of stuff going on. All right, there, well, so. let's go and tell me about it. All right, so now I actually know the whole story and the real story, and it's 
even more interesting than we thought. Okay, here's how it goes. So Wondrich only gave us a little bit of tidbits and there are some facts that didn't quite line up with what we found. Well, not what we found, but what Marius found. But bear with me, this is an interesting story. Here's how it goes. This all starts with a guy named John Morrissey. John Morrissey was a politician, bare knuckle boxer, and a, a fellow criminal. He actually was the head of a gang, which we don't know the name of. William Poole was the head of another gang called the Bowery Boys. And these guys were rival gang leaders, and they were also rival politicians. So I guess there were a bunch of different Democratic parties that were around New York, all kind of vying for supremacy. John Morrissey was the representative of this one called Tammany Hall and William Poole was uh, another representative of one called the Know Nothing Party, and they were also rivals. And so John Morrissey challenges uh, William Poole to a boxing match, which William Poole obviously accepts, and they go and have the match. And during the match, William Poole beats John Morrissey by, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, I, wanna, I need to quote this. Pounding, gouging, bucking, and biting. All right, so John Morrissey has to concede the fight to William Poole, but he was really sore about it. And he didn't want to stand by them and he wanted to exact revenge on William Poole for cheating. Well, it probably was actually cheating, but uh, they're both criminals, so what do you expect? Anyway, so he hired a guy named, uh, an NYPD patrolman named Louis Lou Baker, who had two bodyguards, one named Jim Turner and another one named Patrick Paudine McLaughlin, and they went out to go find, hurt, kill, whatever, maim William Poole. So the trio go to another bar called Stanwix Hall looking for William Poole and they don't find him. But Patrick Podine McLaughlin was there a few hours before and that's probably when the whole whiskey skin thing happened. Then they came back later, they found William Poole there, there was a scuffle. Patrick McLaughlin got his nose bit off and then someone ended up shooting uh, William Poole in the heart. Now here's the thing that's crazy. William Poole got shot in the heart with a gun from the 1800s that was probably had a pretty big caliber lead pellet in it. And he lived for somewhere between, now the, 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 the facts here are a little bit hazy, but somewhere between 11 and 14 days with a, with a, with a, like a lead pellet in his heart. And then his last words were quoted as, I die a true American. Ugh. Now, William Poole is known to all of you guys. You guys might not know that you know him, but William Poole was better known as his gang name, Bill the Butcher. Bill the Butcher uh, was extensively covered in a book by Herbert Ashbery called The Gangs of New York. That same book, The Gangs of New York, is where Wondrich was first introduced to uh, Jerry Thomas and kind of his whole kind of story from the 1800s and got him interested in looking into Jerry Thomas. And then also, of course, Scorsese made a movie with a very, very fantastic performance by Daniel Day-Lewis. So that's the story of the death of Bill the Butcher. If you like this channel, please hit like and subscribe. Check us out on Patreon and YouTube memberships. And then speaking of patrons and YouTube members, thank you so much to our patrons and YouTube members for making this channel uh, be what it is. Without you guys, we really wouldn't be able to do as much as we can accomplish these days. And we are so, so, so thankful to you guys. So thanks so much. You guys are rock stars. And uh, check out our website, theeducatedbarfly.com for articles, our virtual bottle program. Obviously gonna get some recipes there. So there's some really good recipes. Uh, check it out and I will see you guys on another time. And dashes it into the bartender's face. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What? So, <laughs> what I just did. Can I do it again? All right. That was oh, fucking man. terrible. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, it's not gonna get any better. That's all I gotta do. It's not Yeah, hard. and then we cut. Okay. Yeah, so, so, now you know how hard it is to go on camera. Yeah. yeah. Just do that. Oh, okay. That's fine. Just the one time. It's gonna be... Just do it the one time. You obviously can't act. I know. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um,